Welcome to Britain. Home of fine cuisine, exciting nightlife, and animal lovers. But most of all, a land of freedom. In 2003, Tony Blair and George Bush started to spread this freedom to Iraq. Three coaches of day trippers set off for the US military base in Furford, Gloucestershire to protest against the war. On the way, they were pulled over for a routine traffic stop by over a hundred police in riot gear. The officers held them for two hours and searched every nook and cranny. Nothing in here is going to hurt me or you. No, mm. anything sharp in here? Too. Um, I've got keys, a variety of other things. Mm. Do you think any of us are going to actually make it to the protest that we're trying to attend legally? I'm not going to ask those sort of, sorts of comments. We've got a job to do, in which, and we will do it. Excuse me, you missed something. Thank you. The operation unearthed some paper masks, scissors, and several toy soldiers. What he said was that due to the items that have been seized, we can't go on to Fairford because there might be a breach of the peace and so we're going to be escorted back to London. That's what he said. This is illegal. They won't let you stop. You can try. Do you want to get up? Do you want to get up? I need to speak to... They're not letting us out. Can you go on? The police are using the door against me. They're using three people. Hey, 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 this is a moving vehicle. He wants to talk. He wants to talk to your senior officer. They've got five policemen cursing the door closed. They're filming me. In, in legal terms, they can't do this. They won't let us get off the coach to um, go to the toilet. People are feeling quite sick. The driver is actually quite scared because he's been threatened by the police. They've obviously threatened to arrest him. And people are getting pretty desperate. And it feels like we've been hijacked. <laughs> In 1933, a fire broke out in the Reichstag parliament in Germany. Hitler declared that this was a terrorist attack by the communists and used the media to spread fear and panic. He then passed the Reichstag decree, which was an anti-terror law that stated, it is permissible to restrict the rights of personal freedom. This removed the people's rights to a fair trial and free speech. In 1938, the J stamp on an ID card was used to identify Jewish shops. And on Kristallnacht, their windows were smashed and the Holocaust began. As no one could protest, Hitler was able to build the world's most brutal totalitarian state. In 1939, Germany invaded Poland and Britain and France declared war. A generation was devastated in the hope that future generations might live without tyranny. In 1945, the Allies declared victory and said never again. To protect the world from war, they had to protect the citizen from the state. If Hitler had not taken the liberties from the German people, they might have stopped Hitler taking Germany to war. In November 1950, 
the leaders of the war-torn countries of Europe came together to try to prevent these horrors ever happening again. The European Convention on Human Rights was authored by Winston Churchill and contained the fundamental protections of an individual from their own government. These would remain intact in Britain for the next 50 years. A new dawn has broken, has it not? Back in 1997, we couldn't wait to give the Conservative Party their marching orders. Are you happy with the Cometh the hour, cometh the man. Tony Blair wasn't a politician. He was a movie star. Now, when the Labour Party was founded, I've always wanted to do this on the stage at the Asher Hall. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Middle England was charmed, so Tony moved into Downing Street. The nation was in safe hands. New Labour started to pass more laws than any other government in history and in just 10 years created over 3,000 new criminal offences. It is illegal to impersonate a traffic warden. Don't even think about importing potatoes from Poland. And it is now a criminal offence to set off a nuclear bomb. But the terrorist attacks in America on September the 11th, 2001, gave Tony Blair his chance to perform on the world stage. And the world is grateful for all that Great Britain has contributed in the war against terror. Thank you. Good job. To protect the nation from terror, the Blair government passed a series of laws that also undermined our basic liberties. If, God forbid, any terrorist act happens in this country, believe you me, people are not going to be asking whether this legislation is too draconian, whether it's too great an incursion into people's civil liberties. No one's going to be saying that to me. They're going to be saying, are you sure it was tough enough? On the 7th of July 2005, I boarded a train at Finsbury Park in North London to make my normal journey into work. I had a new job in West End. And all of a sudden, bang. We were all covered in black, oily soot and blood, and people were bleeding, people had glass in their feet, people were badly injured, they were crying. So I kept saying, come on, we're nearly there, it's, don't worry, and let's, go and let's go and complain to London Underground, this has been a rubbish journey, and stuff, anything just to stop people panicking. We will not allow violence to change our societies or our values. Blair has always said we won't let the terrorists change our way of life, but they are changing our way of life, and not the terrorists who are changing it, it's the government. Right. We've had the Terrorism Act of 2000, the Anti-Terrorism Crime and Security Act of 2001, the most recent Prevention of Terrorism Act 2005, the changing of the law to allow terrorist suspects to be detained. We've also modernised our extradition laws. We will extend the use of control orders. Should legal obstacles arise, we will legislate further. Don't panic. It's OK. One person got on my train with a bomb. 900 other people kept calm, looked after each other. Thousands of people wanted to help us. London got back to work the following day, got on with it. We haven't had any 7-7s since. It's doable. If I died, I wouldn't want the Constitution to be shredded on my behalf. Let no one be in any doubt. The rules of the game are changing. Conference. 
Tony Blair. Freedom of speech means sometimes having to listen to things you don't want to hear. Tony Blair got round this problem at the Labour Party conference by banning any mention of the Iraq war. Oh, we weren't expecting you. Oh, uh, weren't you? The Germans, don't mention the war. I see. <laughs> Walter Wolfgang has been a member of the Labour Party since before Tony Blair was born. He's 83 years old. I've known him for years. I didn't know till last year he was a refugee from the Nazis. He goes to the Labour conference, say, makes the best speech at the conference. He says nonsense. When Straw summed up, it was too much for me, and I burst out and shouted nonsense. We're in Iraq now for one reason only. We have only And then somebody shouted out, leave the old man alone. And they set on him. Nation building. We want you to leave the premises. On what grounds? On grounds of causing interruption in the arena. I'm sorry. You can't make me leave the premises. I, you know, I've got a right to my view. As Jack has gone right to his. They actually hurt Steve Forrest, but he has a strong constitution, so boozers went after a fortnight. They, they hit him? Oh, yes, they did. Yes. Would you just go, go with him? Walter was detained under the Terrorism Act. They think that if they can control a conference, they control public opinion. They don't. And, of course, the effect was exactly the reverse. I'm really sorry. That should not happen, not, not, not in any circumstances at all. And, look, I wasn't even in the conference centre at the time. That's fine, sir. You can make your protest. Just thank goodness we live in a democracy and you can. Well, the danger is that they will create an atmosphere where public protest becomes more and more difficult. You can now be fined for disagreeing with the government anywhere in the country. You don't even have to voice your dissent to feel the long arm of the law. I certainly didn't think it was going to be offending people to the point where we were actually given a fixed penalty notice. We started as the main suppliers for the Countryside Alliance. A 20 year old girl who was arrested and was walking along when she was told she had to change her shirt. Uh, she's only a 20 year old, really nice girl, very, you know, just lovely actually. And um, we were told to take the top off. And she sort of jokingly said, oh, don't be silly sort of thing. He said, no, no, I mean it, you've got to take the top off. And she just walked away in tears, having been totally intimidated by the police. I think perhaps where I went wrong was I said, which is the offensive word on here. So what happened to your sales after this? Uh, well, booms. You know, you can be arrested for wearing that. Good. <laughs> People do not have free speech, the right to assemble. They don't have the right to examine their government. The government becomes unaccountable. The place where the government is supposed to be accountable is the House of Commons, where our elected representatives work tirelessly on our behalf. Game, game, set and match one more time. <laughs> Order. We should be able to demonstrate and to protest and bring our grievances to the centre of political power in Britain without a policeman's permission. Under the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act, it is now illegal to demonstrate within a kilometre of Parliament unless you get authorisation from the police. I'm sure I've done many wrong things in my life, but um, a serious organised criminal is not one of them. Probably I'm going to spend a little bit of time in prison, um, maybe a week or two, because I wouldn't fill in and sign a form asking the police for permission to remember the dead. Just over here on October the 25th, 
the police came over straight away and they said, well, it's going to be zero tolerance. I went back and found Maya. Right, so definitely going to be arrested. And, you know, things flash through your head. You think, oh, God, how's this going to affect my job opportunities? But then I thought, you know, I don't think I'd ever really want a job that penalises me for being arrested and charged for something that I believe in. Maya and Milan held a memorial service outside Downing Street. They were reading out the names of Iraqi civilians and British soldiers who had died since the invasion of Iraq. Luckily, 14 policemen were on hand. And so we were arrested, put into a van over here, and we were taken back up Whitehall to Charing Cross Police Station. Maya, a vegan chef from Hastings, became a minor celebrity. What sort of a society are we living in when a woman like this who is, doesn't look to me to be a great threat to anybody. He's arrested by the police for a peaceful protest. I think that somebody like Maya ought to be able to stand up. But she's up, not. Do that demonstration. She got and, prosecuted and, for it. And what I would like to know in detail is why it was the police refused authorization. In fact, we had notified the, uh, the police a week beforehand, right. and when we arrived, they were actually expecting us. I remember phoning you up and saying, oh, Mum, you better get the newspapers today. And <laughs> you were going, o'clock at night. night. <laughs> <laughs> the shop was still open. So. <laughs> I do worry for Maya's safety. I'm too much of a coward to, really? like... <laughs> scale fences and climb over barbed wire and, you know, look a what violin in the face. <laughs> I'm just too much like coward. On the anniversary of their arrest, Maya and Milan tried to hold another memorial service in Parliament Square. A bit more nervous today because obviously the police are preparing for us. As one of the organisers of today's event, there's a possible 51 weeks prison sentence. Archibald Kala Hussein. Age unknown, died on the 19th of March, 2006. Lieutenant Tom Townsall, 27, died on the 27th of October, 2006. Hi there. The leaflet regarding an outfit on fast demonstration. It digest and it tells you everything that you need to know. There you go, take one please. No problem, thanks. Is that for your information? Oh, excuse me. One of the objects of putting a policeman in uniform is the prevention of crime. The British policeman is a friend to all except the criminal. He is taught that the police are the servants, not the masters of the public, and that it is their duty to be ready at all times to protect and befriend all those who need help. Did you realise that the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act isn't compatible with the European Convention of Human Rights, Articles 10 and 11, Freedom of Speech and Freedom to Assemble with Others? Well, at the moment, all I'm doing is handing these out, you can have a read for it, and then we can discuss that maybe later. Do you not think this isn't compatible with freedom of speech? Like I've just said, I'm handing them out at the moment. You can have a read through and be able to discuss that. And what exactly are we doing wrong here? The police weren't taking any chances with these repeat offenders, so Meyer and Milan were arrested again. I think for the, for the principle of standing up for our civil liberties, I'm willing to go to prison. And I think by paying the fine, you're kind of saying that, yeah, I'm guilty and I'm not willing to do that, so... Two days later, on Remembrance Day, Tony Blair also remembered the dead at the Cenotaph. He didn't ask for permission, but thankfully wasn't arrested. You know, when I pass protesters every day at Downing Street, and believe me, you name it, they protest against it. I may not like what they call me, but I thank God that they can call me what they want to call me. That's freedom. So why ban protest outside Parliament?
Uh, it's been described, including by me, as a sledgehammer to crack a nut. But where you have a nut, you sometimes need a sledgehammer. Uh, and, 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 and here's a tough nut. If it had been my intention to be a suicide bomber in Whitehall, I would have filled out the form, I would have sent it in, and I would have got back a certificate, and when the police came to see me on my protest, I would have waved around my certificate and say, it's okay, I've got permission. And then I would have blown myself up. Signing bits of paper doesn't protect anybody from anything. As a lone demonstrator, as one person needs a license to demonstrate, we decided, well, what happens if a whole group of people decide to demonstrate individually, but together. And we're all going to go in and apply there, put on our applications, and if the police want to, to turn us into a bureaucratic nation, that's great, we'll play. What have you got? Uh, Goth Pride. What a fantastic thing. There's overfishing of cod to green up the war efforts. Government misuse of metropolitan police. There's protests about lack of funding for hover boots. And a protest calling for more tabloid newspaper sleaze about parliamentarians. Can I get my form out? Oh my I, lord! I, I thought I'd in blue. Look I see. at that! Like that. Cakes are our weapon too in the struggle for civil liberties. Uh, absolutely, and I think I do have all the relevant details oh, on the cake. I think you do. I'd like to see a photocopy of those. <laughs> you wouldn't take the cake, but you did agree that he'd transcribe it. What sort of cake is it? <laughs> Raspberry sponge. The Home Secretary now has the power to make anywhere in Britain a protest-free zone. This is particularly useful in Yorkshire to protect American military bases from dangerous subversives. You need to see police over your shoulder. The first people to be arrested under the new law were two grandmothers, Helen and Sylvia. We decided we'd come here and, and challenge that law by walking into the protected area of the base. We have been charged under section 168 of 28, sorry. And we did manage to get in because although they raised the um, metal grid to stop vehicles coming in, they had failed to observe we were on foot. So we just walked around that. And of course now they've had to cement themselves in. A serious organized criminal police act. No, we have been <laughs> charged under section 128 of the Serious Organized Crime Act, Helen. No, no, criminal. <laughs> he seemed really excited because he said, we've made history. You're the first two to be arrested and we're the first two officers to arrest anybody under the act. <laughs> Let us all sing together. <laughs> but somehow they're more mind games. They're not so clear. Sorry, sorry, oh, Sylvia. Just... Sun's gone. No, it's just mm. whatever the hell I The sheep. Sorry. No, it's the... There's a sheep. Is there someone at the yeah, gate? Oh, dear. So, but even so, yes, they are more stringent and more make life more difficult for us. But, again, the whole point of them is to stop people protesting. Hello. Can I ask us what you're doing? Good afternoon. How are you? You OK? Yes, thank you. We were. Right, there's no need to... Why has that changed? Well, because two policemen have come and interrupt what we were doing. <laughs> what, we'll give you some chat. Obviously filming, yeah, but just what what for? Is it anything specific? It's the Olympic award. <laughs> Is it? Um, I just need to take some details from you all, really. Right. Do so we have to give our right. details? Yeah, well, Under yeah. what section are you going to do that? Yeah. Yeah. To, take, to give you details? Yeah. Well, we've got section 44 power to search everybody and everything here. Does he mean section 44 of the 2000 Terrorism Act? So I can search you and I'll take your details down after I've searched upon the phone. You obviously warrant that. What? Are you in the, are you in the, the space for the Section 44? So he is going to use the Terrorism Act. 
in the power. Field, we're in the middle of a field. We've yes, got, we're not you're, in in you're in direct view of the uh, base. I've oh, got my back to it, officer. I'm not That's looking at it. That's not the point. You're in direct view of the base. You have to quite easily turn around and look at. You know, it's there oh, in front of you. I can't do that. I know. You know. Right. They're, they're I've, looking I've at me. I've given you the reason. We're going to get into a discussion about it. Uh, it's up to you. Would you like to give me your details or not? What do you want to know? Your name, your address, and your date of birth. Um. Do we have amnesia? <laughs> The police have used the Terrorism Act to stop and search over a hundred thousand people. Though none of them were actually terrorists. No. Well, fair enough. Enjoy the rest of your day. Good luck with your uh, Olympic event. Thank you very much. And yours. Do you see what I mean? We didn't give our names. And that's what most people think they have to conform with it. And yet they, they have to have a reason for asking us. Civil liberties and the rights of, that we uh, sort of have in this country have been built up because people have been willing to suffer in order to gain their civil rights. And it's been ordinary people who've done that. In the early 20th century, the suffragettes felt that civil disobedience was the only way to get their message across. It worked. In the 1980s, Margaret Thatcher introduced the poll tax to Britain. This got a few people's backs up, and as a result, the poll tax was scrapped. If the government stops listening, people might go to any lengths to make themselves heard. Climate change is the biggest issue we face. The aviation industry is the fastest growing polluter. So we wanted to do a peaceful protest. It wasn't like we weren't shouting at the police, we weren't doing anything aggressive. But like, to me, it is very important that our daughters didn't do anything to put anybody in any danger. Two more. Sorry, Roddy, Roddy. I'm a Christian minister, some of you might not be, so just focus on something that's important to you, something you think is beautiful, something of value. Hang on to that just for one moment, and with your head down so it looks like a brain. On an unused taxiway at East Midlands Airport, Reverend Malcolm Carroll held a service of remembrance for all the people who had died that year from climate change. And then they sent a hostage negotiator over. But you didn't have any hostages? No! <laughs> they were kept on the taxiway for four hours with an armed response team standing by, then taken to a detention centre, held for a day and a half, and weren't allowed to call their parents. Of course, you know, they were held in solitary confinement for those 36 hours, all separately, in separate police cells. Obviously, I was in the cells at the time, but my son was at home. He was woken by loud banging and the words police at... 2.45 in the morning, went downstairs. He thinks one of the officers had a gun. Uh, and how, how many police? Five. And again, it's something that, um, as a parent, now, obviously I didn't want to inflict that on my family. The police themselves at the front line are getting caught up in this atmosphere that doesn't draw a, a clear distinction between peaceful protest and terrorism. They released us, yeah, one by one in, in the middle of the night in somewhere we didn't know. Um, and told us, our bail conditions were that we weren't allowed to associate with each other. They were then released onto the streets without money or mobile phones and told that if they spoke to each other, they would be re-arrested. But here we are doing stark, staring, simple, safe, peaceful, obvious protest, and bang, down comes this politically driven police boot. I mean, to be honest, when I first got let out and realised that they'd taken my essays and everything, and realised that my house had been searched, my partner was freaked out. I was just like, I'm never doing anything like that again. Um, I really don't want her to do it again. I, mean, <laughs> I really, really don't want her to do it again, and I really, therefore, don't want her to have to do it again. Would you do it again? Yeah. Yeah? Definitely, yeah. Give it a year, though. Yeah. Give it a year. <laughs> this treatment, though worrying and sinister in some ways, is a long way from the terrible treatment that a lot of people are suffering throughout the world for taking political action. But we, I think, have to nevertheless see the 
small steps from where we have civil liberties to where we have none at all. To protect the airline industry, Ellen and Rose were charged with conspiracy, which can attract a lengthy jail term. And I rejoice that we live in a country where peaceful protest is a natural part of our democratic heritage. But in Brighton, some local residents made the mistake of using that democratic heritage outside an American arms company. We're the Brighton Hove Citizens Weapons Inspectors, and we've come to inspect Nido MBM's weapons of mass destruction. It seemed foolish to be demonstrating in London to lobby a government that we already knew was completely committed to this agenda to go to war, when we had in our own backyard people who were manufacturing the very guidance systems that were being used to commit these atrocities. We'd like to go and see what they're doing in the factory. They manufacture circuit boards. Probably a lot of people work, they've never actually seen a bomb. My daughter was already at the forefront of this issue. And therefore, I became very aware of, this, of the importance of the demonstration locally. I can make this a bit larger, Linda. John Catt is an 82-year-old painter who served in the RAF during the Second World War. John and his daughter, Linda, regularly attend the protests outside the EDO weapons factory. The company overreacted and said, we will get uh, an injunction. And this injunction uh, would cover a large area. Initially, the area they wanted to cover was a public park. So if you were in a public park with an anti-arms trade badge on, you could be nicked for, break for breaching the injunction. It applied to everyone. Was this the injunction against the world? It was, it was an injunction against the world over public area. It had the consequence that one of the people who'd been involved in the protests over a long period of time uh, wouldn't have been able to actually go to his own home. A man who became very prominent at protests um, later on, called Mark Lynch, was the person who Edo MBM employed to serve the injunctions. Order number one, Thank serve. You. Order number two, serve. Who are you, sir? It's not being served. It's just dropped. Order number 13, serve. He's already given me. <laughs> <laughs> Are you an officer of the... I saw you push that man. I saw you push that man. That's very naughty. There is an injunction in force. The injunction says you must be on that side of the road. If you refuse to clear the road, then you are liable to be arrested for obstruction of the highway. If you come off there and cause obstruction of the highway, you will be arrested for obstruction of the highway. What do you think you're doing? I went over to the other side of the road as usual and said to a police officer, all right, if I make some sketches, not today, he said. You have to go over on the glass verge. And that was my first realization that this was a different world now. And they went up and down twice, up and down the line of demonstrators, and on their return the second time, I didn't hear what the police officer was saying. He knew perfectly well I couldn't hear what he was saying because of the terrific row that we were making as demonstrators with all sorts of equipment, you know, hailers and so on. Eventually had my hands handcuffed from behind. Hey, how does it feel to be a nice cop now? How does it feel to be a nice cop? Let him go! Let him go! Let him go! And um, shortly after that, my daughter accompanied me in the police van. I saw this situation happening and instinctively ran to the aid of my father. Yeah, 
and I was arrested um, in the chaos um, and accused of assaulting a police officer. Chris and Linda were charged with assaulting a police officer. Fourteen named defendants were on the injunction as being the people who were really alleged to be the main group behind this campaign of harassment against Edo MBM. Those people found themselves repeatedly arrested, done deliberately to blacken their names and to justify the enormous amount of money that had been spent on policing the demonstrations there, particularly in Christen's case, nine times. Sussex police were talking with the company and with the lawyer about how they should proceed and how they should work to strengthen the injunction case and how they should, in effect, arrest to order. So that what they would do is when they applied for their injunction, they would say, look, we've had so many arrests here, X, Y, Z, 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 blah, 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 and here's the list of them. Which, so they would then go out and do the shopping to make sure they had the arrest quota to put before the court to try and get the injunction. To stop the protests. To stop the protests. The anti-stalking law that was used against the protesters was written by the lawyer Timothy Lawson Crossenden, who also represented EDO and was responsible for the injunction strategy. There were some very serious criminal charges that were brought against the protesters. They were sort of uh, assaulting a police officer. I mean, that was yeah, that was, that, that, yeah, but that, that all got dropped away. Why, why was that Why was that dropped? I don't know. I think, I think the protesters claimed it's because the police didn't want to disclose various documents. We were asking for emails, communications, contact between um, Lawson Cruttenden, Edo and Chief Inspector Cox. Sussex Police didn't want evidence to come out in court about their collusion with Edo MBM and the extent of their involvement with the factory. Um, well, that's what the protesters say and they would always say that, wouldn't they? I mean, the position is that the police are pretty careful to act as referees. They dropped eight cases in one go. Right, let me show you with that. This is the court order that the injunction now only applies to five named defendants. Thank you very much. Served. Lovely. Any comment? Any comment? Not at all. Okay. I'd like to give you this. The injunction, which you've been released over the last 11 months, now only applies to five named defendants. I'm totally aware of that. OK. I'm totally... Sir, excuse me. <laughs> Come here. It's off here. You can take off with you, or I will make you fresh and fresh. I'll go No way. At the end of the story, it's worked out better than I think anybody could have hoped for. The injunction's totally collapsed. Edo had to fly in executives from the States, hire another group of solicitors to offer substantial cash payments to the individuals that they'd uh, targeted for an injunction. Every one of the 35 charges was dropped. The protests still continue. And if you want to join in, they're every Wednesday between 4 and 6. What have the police actually called it? Right, now this is what uh, the police have variously referred to as a crib sheet or a spotter card, cards used by the forward intelligence teams. Well, but you're on there, aren't you? I am on there, yes. Uh, in fact, I'm next to Mark Thomas of Channel 4 fame. I know of cases of people on an anti-war demo. You know, wherever they went, they, this team of police officers would walk around filming them openly, and all they were, were they were a protester. Yeah, yeah, no right. history of violence or anything like that. Protester. We're Dixon of Dot Green, if you like. We're, we're community policing meets public demonstrations is Ford Intelligence Team. This very sort of overt form of surveillance that was pioneered by the Ford Intelligence Teams, whose job it was to follow protests around, follow activists around, be outside their houses, sort of catching criminals. The role of the police goes to following people about in case they commit criminal offences. I mean, would you feel comfortable if someone came up and had a camera right here or this close? I mean, it's, it, it's quite intimidating, which sure. has been done to me. Sure. I mean, well, I mean how, how close are they allowed to get? If they're putting the camera right in the face of everybody, then, then frankly, I don't know, yeah. because I wasn't there, but I would suggest that probably isn't entirely what they're meant to do. If you're in a public place, 
there's every chance, especially if you're in London, that actually there's some CCTV cameras on top mm. of the local lamppost taking your picture anyway. People all over the world have, have fought to have these, these basic rights. We in Britain, who have enjoyed them for so long, are a little bit too complacent. And I think the danger is that we might wake up one day when it's a little too late and say, hang on a minute, what happened to the right not to be snooped upon all the time? Welcome to Counter Terror World. This is an annual security and surveillance trade fair where an entire industry capitalizes on our fear. Anyone can buy the very latest in high-tech snooping equipment, including cameras that can see through your clothes. So you've got a gun? Yeah. Feel it, yeah, yeah. And you're going to, so you just conceal it? Yeah, well, yeah. And that's the gun. What's, what's that? You've got, you've got a gun here as well? It, so, it might be a little bit of lint, bullet when they can't pull in. But it, it's saying you've got two guns here. And it's got three now. It, it, it takes a while for it to adjust. And okay. You know, this is like a temporary setting. And we had two days to set up. Here, you can see that dark spot. That's the gun. Could be something else. Well, it could be something else. We can't tell you what it is, but we can tell you that there's something there. And as you walk closer to the camera, well, it might go, pick yeah. it up. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's got something. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So, yeah, I, and, and then in there is the weapon. Yeah. It comes out. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. That's, that's an actual so, you just have cameras everywhere. The only thing we've got to worry about is power, not worry about privacy at all. No, no, it, it, go, a camera will go anywhere. Right. But we need power to power them. Right. So, you're tracking the guy all the time. Yeah. You're seeing everything he's seeing. Yeah. And you can probably see him yes. from a camera. Yes. Up there. This wasn't a surveillance product. But it's more exciting in this field. I've got to yeah. be honest, there's more opportunities in this. So yeah. what, it, it, it sort of enables people to shoot people. That's him shooting. Yeah. But at least this way, they can say, no, 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 that's not him. That's the wrong one. <laughs> yeah. Is there anywhere that you think that there shouldn't be? If, if for example, um, you know, bona fide students could not use a toilet because other students were burning down the toilet, then I would probably recommend that we look at the hand basins right. and, and exclude the uri urinals and cubicles. Okay. And do you think there's ever going to come a point where we have too many CCTV cameras, or is that just impossible? No, if you've nothing to hide, why would you be afraid of it? So you do subscribe to that belief, you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear? Yeah. Or have you never had anything to hide? Um, good question. And if there's four million cameras yeah. ish yeah. in the UK, sure. that means it's two hundred and fifty thousand operators to yeah. need it. Which isn't the case. Which isn't the case. case. No. How many are there? Well, operators. Yeah. I have no idea. What qualification do you do? you, do you need to get to work in a control room? None whatsoever. Ostensibly, you could go straight to the job. You, you on know, the first day. On the first could, day, oh, you could be, be there, getting hold of the controls and working cameras. Now, that's not necessarily good. How do we reconcile liberty with security in this new world? Let me say something to you. I don't want to live in a police state or a big brother society or put any of our essential freedoms in jeopardy. In 1787, an architect invented the perfect prison and called it the Panopticon. The prisoners would be seen wherever they were but would never know if they were being watched. It was designed to control the prisoners using surveillance alone, and was seen as the ultimate power of mind over mind. No panopticons were ever built, but Tony Blair's most expensive legacy will be to have turned the entire country into a perfect prison. The government wants to put a tracking device in every car on the road. Surveillance cameras are being connected to directional microphones, as well as facial recognition software, so they will always know where you are and what you are saying. But we can make choices in spending too. And instead of wasting hundreds of millions of pounds on compulsory identity cards as the Tory right demand, let that money provide thousands of extra police officers on the beat where they can actually protect people. 
But now New Labour wants to spend billions of our money on compulsory ID cards. We will pursue identity cards because they're right. We think it is legitimate and right in this day and age to ask people to carry identity cards. It is the right thing to do. Within a few years, you will be forced to carry an ID card, which will store a gold mine of private information, which will be uploaded to a database called the National Identity Register. Every time you interact with the state, it will form an audit trail, so the government will know your entire life's history. This will be linked to your medical records, your school records, and your DNA structure. Gordon Brown has already said that he will sell your information on to big businesses, whereas computer hackers will be able to get it for free. Your address, every time you move, you must tell the National Identity Register. If you fail your 11 plus, that'll be on the database. Buy a fishing license. If you're a member of a trade unit, go to the pharmacy to get drugs for your arthritis. If you've got HIV AIDS, that'll be on the database. Put your child in school. Then, when you apply for a job, they'll look at you, push you out, never, never consider you. And that is the police state. Why should they have this information? Why should they know what do they want with it? Why can't they just butt out of it? Hello? How are you? The information held on you and your children will be used to stop crimes being committed even before they've taken place. If we're not prepared to predict and intervene far more early, then there are children that are going to grow up in families that we know perfectly well are completely dysfunctional and the kids a few years down the line, are going to be a menace to society and actually a threat to themselves. I'm interested in how early, because a lot of the evidence suggests you need to be getting in there while the child is still in nappies, frankly. Or pre-birth, even. But if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. The danger that I fear in, in the great data collection, the database, is incompetence. Computer says no. <laughs> if the computer says no in a society where virtually everything that you do relies on the computer saying yes, what is that? Is that a one-off event or is that from that point on until you sort it out, you're a non-person? In the past, they have had to justify each interference with our privacy and our liberty. And now we will have to justify our existence, our identity to them. To say if we introduce identity cards, which after all, large numbers of countries in the world have, that this is an authoritarian act, is absurd. It is truly absurd. Lots of other countries do have ID cards, but in most cases they were forced onto the people by authoritarian dictators like Napoleon. ID cards were introduced to Britain during the Second World War. Churchill regretted taking our dearly valued liberties and promised to scrap them once the war was over but he lost the post-war election before he could, and the incoming Labour government kept them on. The information on the card shot up, and police began to demand them from people at random. In 1950, Harry Wilcock, an ordinary man from Leeds, took a stand. The police ordered him to show his ID card, but he refused and said, I am a Liberal and I'm against this sort of thing. He was arrested, but fought his case to the highest court in the land. And as the cards were so hated, he became a national hero. The judge ruled that to demand an ID card from all and sundry has turned law-abiding citizens into law-breakers. The government abolished the cards and gave the nation back its privacy. In Rwanda, the Belgian colonial government introduced ID cards to split up the native Tutsi and Hutu tribes by their physical differences. In 1994, the country devoured itself as the Hutus mercilessly attacked the Tutsis. An ID card marked Tutsi would get you killed at any roadblock. As everyone had an ID card, it made the genocide incredibly efficient and nearly a million lives were taken in only 100 days. The secret police in Soviet East Germany had a file on every man, woman and child with their history from the cradle to the grave, which were used as a means of control. They couldn't computerise these records as they didn't have the technology. If they had, it would look like the National Identity Register. There are distinct advantages in a national identity scheme 
that could not just help us disrupt terrorists and criminals. The fact that there was a biometric identity card system in place in Spain did not prevent the Madrid bombings. We know the bombers are very careful to carry ID. Mohammed Sadiqi Khan actually gave his ID to three of the other bombers to carry um, and made sure it was found at the scene. The card or the record doesn't have you know, terrorists stamped on it in, in yellow. These are just people. Mohammed Atta showed a perfectly valid passport when he got on board that flight which he later flew into the World Trade Center. We therefore here in Britain stand shoulder to shoulder with our American friends in this hour of tragedy. has chemical and biological weapons, which could be activated within 45 minutes. I've never been on a march before. I just felt as though all of a sudden we were on a roller coaster and I didn't want to be on it. The war would create more anger and frustration between the Muslims and the West. The kaleidoscope has been shaken, the pieces are in flux, Soon they will settle again. Before they do, let us reorder this world around us. The day after the July 7th bombings, the Sun newspaper demanded that potentially innocent people should be locked up in internment camps. They decide every time there's a bomb, they've got to show they're taking action, they're tough, the Sun continued to demand action, so Tony Blair responded by trying to tear up one of our oldest liberties. He announced that he would give the police the power to detain you without charge for three months. Stunning. I, you know, after what had happened over Ireland, wrongful convictions with full jury trials. In 1974, the IRA bombed two pubs in Birmingham, killing 21 people. The Birmingham Six had confessions beaten out of them in police custody. It took them 16 years to prove their innocence. To suggest that you can hold someone for questioning for 90 days, is, I, I still can't believe that they, that they seriously did it. Secondly, in respect to the 90 days, the reason we are putting this forward is because the police tell us that they believe such a power is necessary to prevent terrorist acts. Interestingly, the police justification was, ah, we have a problem here because most of the defendants we arrest stay silent and a lot of the period is is used up with them praying and they're represented by the same solicitor so it's very difficult for us to have a good period of time with them and we feel they're just on the cusp of telling us something 
and we have to release them. So if we have them for 90 days, it'll be much easier, basically, to crack them. That's what they're on about. On the day of the Commons vote, the Sun put a bomb victim on the front page and insisted the law be changed. They used a photograph of um, Professor John Tollock, who is an expert, as it turns out, in media manipulation of images. There I am, and I'm not, of course, asked by the Sun. The Sun, like a number of tabloids, takes a totally populist view about being for the people, but they don't manage even to ask the person they, they use. I was totally opposed to that legislation. I have no doubt where the country is on this. The country will think that Parliament has behaved in a deeply irresponsible way today. I've got no doubt about that at all. The eyes to the right, 291. The nose to the left, 322. For the first time since he came to power, Tony Blair lost a vote in the House of Commons. But he still managed to increase the pre-charge detention to 28 days. We are not living in a police state. Police are searching a house in East London now. This was a huge police operation involving nearly 250 Viable officers. chemical device. The two men detained are believed to be brothers. The intelligence was such that it demanded an intensive response. A few months after the police were given these new powers, they received a random tip-off about a bomb factory in London. So 250 armed police investigated. During the raid, they shot one of the suspects. I heard a loud bang, and it was a big flash. I see blood coming down my chest, and I see the hole in my chest. I realized that my own brother got shot for no reason. They tried to murder my brother. I've been in his house, there's he ain't no bomb factory. He's got a living room just like everyone else's living room. On this occasion, it seems we were wrong. While the brothers were detained under the new limit, a smear campaign began against them. After a week, they were released without charge. The raid itself, I am perfectly content, was justified, and the operation uh, was one which was carried out extremely well by the Metropolitan Police. Who knows, it might have been me next. That makes me angry. It makes me realize that we can't trust the government, we can't trust the police. <laughs> Under political pressure to generate results, the police will inevitably target the wrong people. The longer you can be detained before charge, the greater the injustice when mistakes are made. Your liberty uh, not to be held by the authorities unless the authorities could produce charges against you, that liberty has been around in this country for about a thousand years, and it's now suffered a serious erosion. And, you know, it's going to take a bit of a job to get it back again. Does Magna Carta mean nothing to you? Did she die in vain? <laughs> Britain, 1215. A row kicked off between King John and the barons over money. They rode the king out to an island in the Thames and he couldn't come back until he had signed the Magna Carta. The important bit is Clause 39. No free man shall be imprisoned except by the lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land. No one could be locked up without being charged before a court, and everyone was innocent until proven guilty by a jury. This was called habeas corpus. In 1772, a captain of a slave ship brought one of the slaves back to England, so some Quakers got a writ of habeas corpus. The slave was brought before a court, but as there was no charge, he was released. The judge ruled that slavery is so odious that nothing can be suffered to support it. A few years later, Britain banned slavery. Completely. Habeas corpus was suspended in Britain in the dark days of 1940. The Nazis were on the brink of invasion. So Churchill passed a law giving him the power to lock up fascists without charge. He hated the idea and called this power the foundation of all totalitarian government. When he knew the Germans couldn't invade, Churchill tore up the law and the fascists were released. In 1971, the British government tried to crush the IRA by bringing in a law called internment. 
This meant the government could detain suspected terrorists without charge, but it completely backfired. Suddenly internment comes in, you can be interred without trial. You have one judge, no jury, boom, you're off. You know, that was a massive recruitment uh, for Republicans. Massive recruitment. There's natural injustice and people just go, why the fuck should we do this? What are we going to do? We're going to fight it. How are you going to fight it? Well, son, come and talk to me. The 2005 Prevention of Terrorism Act abolished habeas corpus. The Home Secretary gave himself the power to put you on the house arrest without charge. Jennifer and Dares are two retired headmistresses who help people who have been imprisoned in their own home. It was the radio on. The loot? You see it, you see it. Oh, yes? Yes. That's the toilet, you see? You open the toilet, toilet seat. Can you hold the door with your feet just on this? Yeah. That's the toilet here. Uh, the toilet's here. See it, you can see it facing the table where I eat, where I sleep, where I exercise, and where I cook. I've been telling them that we need to have at least two separate places. I'm locked up in here for 15 uh, and a half hours every day for a limited uh, period of time. Uh, I'm not allowed to let anyone into my premises. I have to sign every day in a police station and I am tagged, as you see. I have the tagging equipment here, uh, more tag, and the box of the tagging is over there. There is no limit, absolutely no limit, you know. It's indefinite. There is one thing which I haven't showed you as well. I mean, part of my bail condition, which is one of the worst ones, is they gave me a map. Between the eight and a half hours that I am out, I need to stick by this map, which is, as you see here, the green area. That's where I'm stuck. One station, second station, and that's it. I'm stuck here. And what, what happens if you go outside that area? I'll, be, I'll go back to prison immediately. They will send me back to prison, based of my bail condition. Who, who, who drew that map? It's a judge. Just drew it, picked the pen and drew it randomly. That is it. And is it o o almost like a prison? It is m worse than prison, because you can see your freedom outside the window, but you can't go out there and enjoy yourself. You know, like my life has been destroyed. Maloud was first arrested in 2002. The recent arrests of Algerian suspects, both here and elsewhere in Europe, are the result of unprecedented cooperation between Britain, France and Algeria. This cooperation meant passing on to the British police intelligence extracted using torture. It said that Maloud and eight other men had been making the deadly poison ricin in a flat in Wood Green. They were all arrested and the flat was raided. The police took every precaution as they found a handful of cherry stones, a coffee grinder, and a jar of Nivea. These dangerous materials were sent to the lab for testing, but before the results came back... As the arrests that were made earlier today show, this danger is present and real and with us now, and its potential is huge. What got less publicity was the fact that at the end of the day, there wasn't any ricin. But this detail didn't stop Maloud's case being used as a reason to invade Iraq. The President of the United States and the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. It's my heart to welcome uh, Tony Blair back to the White House. Recently, uh, Tony Blair's government routed out a poison plot. It, it should say to the people of Great Britain, there is a present danger. That weapons of mass destruction are a danger to people who love freedom. We know that these terrorist networks would use any means they can to cause maximum death and destruction. I want to congratulate you on your fabulous job of using your intelligence and your law enforcement to protect the people of Great Britain. But at the United Nations, Colin Powell got a bit carried away. The network is teaching its operatives how to produce ricin, less than a pinch of ricin in your food, and death comes within... 72 hours, it is fatal. And so we went to war. Back in England, Maloud was still awaiting trial in Belmarsh High Security Prison. All the way through the two and a half years, I felt like a convicted terrorist. At the end of 2004, still no ricin, the ricin trial finally began. Some jurors from the trial have come forward 
on condition their identities are not fully revealed. And I kept on expecting, in, in a kind of fair-minded way, that the prosecution would eventually provide us with some real evidence for this. And it never appeared. It never turned up. The day the prosecution closed their case, I would just remember sitting there with my jaw open and thinking, wow, I can't believe it. What are these guys doing here? They were innocent. They, were, yeah. they, they gave innocent to all yeah. four. Only one was condemned. So four were declared. And they, they didn't say that he was involved and they just said a nuisance. Yes. But the other four were acquitted and then they dropped a case. Months go by in that particular year after the acquittal. The government picks them up again. Two months after the July bombing, they came to re-arrest me, saying because you were involved in the racing case, and therefore you're a threat to national security, and therefore we, the Home Office has the right to deport you, even though I was cleared of the racing, mm. the so-called racing which never existed. Did he tell you about his re-arrest? Well, he said that they came at about four in the morning, about 30 police. Well, what woke him up was the people in the flat downstairs, a mother with two children, screaming. In, in terror, they went in there first. They went to the wrong flat? Yes. Shields and the, you know, mask, guns, torchlight, everything. They just break my door and... And he put up his hands like this, and one of them caught him by the wrist and threw him down, and the others came, and they carried him into his living room. Pushed me to the floor and then jumped on my, on my back. I couldn't, I couldn't even breathe. They were all, about eight of them or ten on my back. Now, if they believed he was a threat, to security or likely to abscond, would they have left him free the whole of August? They've made mistakes, I think, and they don't want to admit it. Yeah. You do know about it, don't you? No. That there's just... no ricin. For 23 years, no senior British minister went to Algeria because the regime was so terrible. Yeah. Then you have September the 11th, and there's this war on terror, and Algeria becomes an, one of the coalition. That immediately means it's an acceptable regime. Yeah. So the people who were opposing it are terrorists. Miloud himself had, had fled to escape military service. Our government was seriously thinking of deporting people back to Algeria to face, to put it mildly, an uncertain future, and much more likely torture disappearance and possibly death. Because of the miscarriage of justice, these jurors help Malud and meet with him regularly. I think what we owe Malud at the end of all this is, is the choice to do what he wants with his life because, like it or not, Britain has taken away his choices and he's got no future that he can see. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. and, you know, making me feel that uh, as long as I'm st I stay in Britain, I will not never have a life, you know. And I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, you know, growing up and I feel that my life is being destroyed. I will never have this years back. With Baloo, what do you think is going to happen to him? We don't like to think. Oh, I know it's better. We just spoke at the press. Well, I've seen I've seen Even though he was found innocent by a jury, the government and most of the media have always maintained he is guilty. We were very close indeed to disaster. There was not a specific uh, understood and named target. The war on terror kept David Blunkett very busy. In 2003, he got to fly to the US of A and signed an extradition treaty which puts your liberty at the mercy of American justice. I'm very pleased indeed today at this very particular time in the collaboration of the US and the United Kingdom encountering those who would put us at risk. There has never, in my mind, been a more gross dereliction of a government's duty to its citizens than this law. And it has made us, in matters of criminal justice, the 51st state of America. 
Tony Blair has rejected demands to renegotiate Britain's extradition arrangements with the United States. Giles Darby, David Birmingham and Gary Mulgrew were handed over to US Marshals at Gatwick Airport early this morning. They're scheduled to touch down in Houston where they're accused of a multi-million pound fraud. The so-called NatWest 3 have been extradited from Britain to Texas. They're now in this courthouse behind me where they're being fingerprinted, photographed and then will spend their first night behind bars. You know, we're fundamentally unsympathetic people. We're ex-bankers who made a lot of money out of doing a deal which turns out to look really smelly. I don't know nothing about what he's done or not done, right? But insofar as he's accused of anything, the crime he's meant to have committed took place in this country against UK interests and NatWest Bank, and yet the British authorities, CPS, NatWest, don't want to do anything against him. It's the Americans who have found some tangential involvement in the Enron business who want to extradite him and simply on their say-so, without the production of any prima facie evidence, he's been super magnetically suctioned over to America. If we can go, anybody can go. If we lose our case and this law is not changed, the floodgates will open. We are the people who carry this fight to the government. But David lost that fight in June 2006. When all his appeals collapsed, and a date was set for the NatWest 3 to fly to Texas. The act seems to allow people, human beings, to be sent like sacks of carrots from this country where they live, where they have their families and their lawyers and their support, to the other side of the world, without even the need for the barest minimum of the case to be shown here in the United Kingdom. So how's it been with them and the kids? Um, it's been a lot better than I thought it would be with, uh, with the children. Jemima, who, who's eight, has taken it in her stride. In fact, she picked it up instantly. I think she's going to be a lawyer one day, God forbid. She just said, well, that's silly. Why can't they have a court case here? Freddie, who's seven, has had a lot more difficulty with it. He's daddy's boy at the moment, and I think, uh, I think it's going to be tough for him. And Archie, who's four, doesn't know which end is up, frankly. It'll dawn on him one day. Uh, and Emma's been absolutely... Astounding, frankly. I definitely married the right woman. You kind of got to the police station, there's just those mental scenes. Yeah. Where everyone was running and tripping over everyone else. What did that feel like? Um, I didn't think I was there. I might have been there in body, but <laughs> I certainly wasn't there in mind. I just, I, you know, I, I came back home and I sort of switched on the television and they were obviously rerunning from what had happened in the morning and I... I just thought, gosh, I, I, it just didn't feel like that had been me. And I was, you know, all I was thinking was, you know, this is just uh, so gallantly horrible. It's a sad day for you guys, because most of you, I suspect, are British. And you got let down today by your own government. Get them out. Extradited suspects are rarely given bail in the US, as they're considered a flight risk. But because of the media storm, David, Giles and Gary were all released under strict bail conditions and are still in Texas awaiting trial. So what's it like being married to a felon? <laughs> because I was due to have a 40th birthday in August and so I obviously cancelled that and ended up flying out to Houston to see David for that week. And a friend of mine said, I bet you never thought you'd be spending your 40th birthday in Houston with a tagged man. <laughs> You know, there's no other country in the world, really, who will extradite its own citizens to a foreign country without a prima facie case. You know, that's the main thing. Yeah, yeah extradition is fine when it is justified. And I know it's hard on America and in some small corner of this vast country out in Nevada or Idaho or these places I've never been to but always wanted to go, <laughs> out there there's a guy getting on with his life, minding his own business, saying to you, the political leaders of this country, why me? And why us? And why America? And the only answer is because destiny put you in this place in history, in this moment in time, and the task is yours to do. You're not going to be alone. We will be with you in this fight for liberty. Tony Blair will have his desired place in the history books. 
But it will be as the British Prime Minister who helped destroy the one liberty that was supposed to be non-negotiable. <laughs> Look, I came back from Guantanamo yesterday, and they have this chair that they call the torture chair, where they strap people in, these people who are on peaceable, nonviolent hunger strikes, and they strap them in and they force this tube up their nose twice a day, 43 inch long, force feed them, pull it out of their nose afterwards, and there are far worse things than that. These people are not considered prisoners, nor are they treated like prisoners, as what we would treat a military prisoner as. They're not considered prisoners? No, sir. What's being kept for nearly a year and a half? At detained personnel, sir. That, that's, that's, that's categorically different from being a prisoner, is it? Is that uh, yes, better sir. than being a prisoner? Yes, sir. As far as the, uh, their treatment, sir, yes, sir, I would say it is. A prisoner is uh, someone found guilty of a, per, uh, of a crime and being sentenced. These people here are no more than merely detained, and we're extracting information. I was spat at, sworn at, kicked, punched, uh, dragged around naked, uh, photographed, and uh, had dogs barking at us and then watching the same humiliating process taking place uh, on other detainees. It is deeply shocking that this has been allowed to continue for so long. We've seen in total something like 750 people being held at Guantanamo. We have heard of the hunger strikes, the force feeding, and we know of the suicides. Where were you when 9-11 when happened? Uh, I was in Afghanistan where I had moved to with my wife and my children working on a project to build a school for girls and, uh, air and uh, wells in the drought-stricken regions of the northwest. Went to Pakistan to where I have uh, family and relatives that I received a knock on the door 12 o'clock at night on the 31st of January 2002 and I opened the door to face Pakistani, whoever they were, officers perhaps, uh, who pointed a gun at me, put a hood over my head, just before the head, the head was covered, uh, I saw them walking towards my uh, room where the children had been sleeping. The Americans were offering rewards of $5,000 per head, so that many people were actually handed over in this way. I was held there for a couple of weeks. Uh, for, on the first occasion, the British intelligence were present, and then we were just held as literally, uh, and, and I don't exaggerate with the term when I say this, as literally as animals in pens, until I was moved to another facility, which was Bagrath, the US air base, where they had a detention center specifically for harsh types of interrogation. But even worse than that, to have the sounds of a woman screaming next door, which at that point, uh, because I was unaware of what had happened to my wife, I believed it was my wife screaming next door. And how, how long were you in Bagram for? Uh, approximately 10 months, uh, after which I was moved to Guantanamo Bay. How long were you in Guantanamo for? Uh, I think it was a total of uh, about two years. Is there a, a gradual process of getting information out? Tell me, what's your task? We really can't get into interrogation issues. That's that's just not something that we discuss. When the interrogators come along, how long do they take men away from? And how often does that happen? Well, it depends on how long. That's not, that's not quite. Anything dealing with interrogations, we can't discuss. I see. So where was the British Prime Minister while Mozam was being tortured by the United States military? Good afternoon. Tony Blair is a leader of conviction, of passion, of moral clarity and eloquence. He is a true friend of the American people. The United Kingdom has produced some of the world's most distinguished statesmen, and I'm proud to be standing with one of them today. I would like to pay tribute to your leadership in these difficult times, because ever since September the 11th, the task of leadership 
has been an arduous one. And I believe that you have fulfilled it with tremendous conviction, determination, and courage. Thank you, sir. What happens now in Guantanamo Bay uh, to the people detained there, particularly whether there's any chance that the president will uh, return the British citizens to faith? Well, the only thing I know for certain is that these are bad people. And we look forward to working closely with the Blair government to deal with the issue. There's footage of President Bush uh, speaking about the importance of getting the right information out of individuals he characterized as criminals at Guantanamo. And in many of those shots, Mr. Blair is standing right beside him, silent. Mozam's father also went to Washington, but did campaign for his son's release. What I believe led to my release eventually was the embarrassment uh, that I believe this government felt as a result of pressure from my father and other campaign groups who were supporting him. But it seemed to me that for every little thing that the Americans felt they were justified for, the Brits were there sort of behind them, uh, patting them on the back. Put your hands on your head, reach, shuffle, shuffle to the left, move, you do the monkey spot and then squat. This factory in Birmingham called Hyatt's does a roaring trade selling shackles to Guantanamo Bay. I mean, yesterday is the, the fifth anniversary of Guantanamo. Yeah. Um, but of course, also this year is the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade. Right. Uh, and of course, Hyatt's used to make what were known as nigger colours for the slave trade. You know, if I think today, if uh, William Wilberforce was alive, yeah. I've got absolutely no doubt he would be standing here today. Doing the shackle shuffle. Doing the shackle shuffle, <laughs> saying that this is outrageous. So it is a shame on this country that we are complicit in torture. We can complicit with these renditions and we support British industry to profit from the torture of our own residents. That is why we are here today. What we are involved in is the 21st century slave trade, where people like Omar de Gaius, whose brother is here today, were, were kidnapped and then shipped to Guantanamo and have not been charged with any crime. Thank you very much. And this is the fifth year that my brother has been held uh, hostage in Guantanamo Bay uh, without any charge uh, or any uh, legal right to defend himself. Omar de Gaius, um comes from Libya. His father was uh, tortured and killed by Gaddafi back in 1980. The family thankfully escaped six years later, naturally came to Britain, and they became refugees in this country, and were very grateful to Britain for providing them that sanctuary. Omar really wanted to be here because he wanted to study law. He had a real strong interest in justice, and he didn't feel that in Libya there was any law to study. Now, unfortunately, 25 years on, we're seeing history revisited where Omar is in Guantanamo. The United States and Britain want to send him back to Libya because in the wake of the Iraq war, Bush and Blair say that Gaddafi became a member of the democratic fold, for goodness sake, as if anyone believes that. The Libyans came to Guantanamo, they looked him in the eye, and one of them said, you know, your problem's not with the Americans, it's with us and went on to say, we can't do anything to you here in Guantanamo, but when you come back to Libya, I personally am going to kill you. That was a quote from one of the Libyans, and uh, it's so sad for Omar's family. If they're guilty, they must bring them to the court. If not, release them. They must release them. The thing he was really disturbed by as well is that the medical staff are actually involved in the torture. Um, and so that they know all the, the weaknesses that the, the actual detainees have. I know colleagues may not necessarily agree uh, with the approach of the United States, but I say that it is understandable that they have taken the action that they have. But I, I, I do not think the United States is being unreasonable. I have big dream every day, every night, I say to 
heard his voice and everything and see him in my dream. But when I open my eyes, I find nothing. He's so far from me. In place I can't see him or to talk to him or something. The prisoners in Guantanamo represent 4%, just 4% of the American prisoners held in secret detention around the world. 96% we're not even talking about. What we also see is what the Americans call extraordinary rendition, which is where people are then moved from countries that would not use torture to many countries that do use torture to be interrogated. Render, the ultimate low-cost airline. We've flown thousands of lucky travelers around the world on our luxury Gulfstream jets. Our routes include all the world's torture hotspots. We'll be stopping to refuel at Prestwick and Manchester airports. Even though this is against international law, the British government will turn a blind eye, so there's no delay to your journey. We regret to announce that you won't be able to see the in-flight movie due to a bag over your head. And for your own safety, passengers will be shackled and bound for the entire flight. Once we reach your final destination, we'll swiftly hand you over to your hosts for an activity-filled holiday. Why torture people at home when it's cheaper to do it abroad? Rendere, driving down the cost of dying. So it's absolutely clear in international law that if you assist torture, facilitate it, even turn a blind eye to it, that state is responsible for collusion and complicity in torture. For example, in Syria, where they have a device called the German chair which is designed to stretch a prisoner's spine in some case the, the breaking point and Uzbekistan boiling prisoners alive Egypt electric shock treatment Morocco cutting people up with broken bottles now these are detailed by the United States itself and yet at the same time uh, another part of the United States was sending people to these locations I used the flight logs of CIA planes and what these flight logs showed was that there really were flights into Egypt there were flights into Uzbekistan, flights into Morocco. Stephen Gray has now published evidence that CIA torture flights are frequently refueling at British airports. Anything that the CIA does in Europe is always done with the, with the assistance of, of uh, European governments. There is no evidence that I know of that any of these 200 flights have been used for rendition. There simply is no truth in the claims. There is no evidence to suggest any of them fit into that category. As we said often enough, we have no evidence uh, of uh, that to which you're referring. Let's deny it. Well, I'm just saying we have no evidence. If you ask me to prove a negative, um, we've got no evidence. Thank you. Are the CIA cooperating with your letter? Good. I think that's all you have time for now. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. It's not good enough to say there is no evidence. You should go out and look for it. And, and has our government done that? No. If evidence emerges to show that the Prime Minister knew, or should have known, that this type of activity was going on, then, yes, he is open to the possibility of criminal charge for complicity in torture. If people are tortured, they'll confess. They'll confess to anything. They'll make it up. They'll agree with what is said. So, how have our leaders got the idea we get good information from torture? You were going to tell me what I want to know. It's just a question of how much you want it to hurt. You were going to tell me. What is happening at 8 o'clock? What is your primary objective? Secretary of Defense! They are reliable information gained from torture. Heller. Secretary Heller. <laughs> Secretary Heller's the target. Call Secret Service now. You cannot talk about democratic values. You cannot say that you want to spread them around the globe if, uh, if the means of spreading them is torture. Riz Ahmed is an actor who starred in the film Road to Guantanamo. Life imitated art when Riz flew back from the Berlin Film Festival and was detained as a terrorist at Luton Airport. I knew that I was an actor for this film and that I'd been travelling here for these reasons. The guy who got me in a wrist lock and took the phone off me sat down on a table um, quite close to me and started pretending as though he was going through my phone. Oh, fucking Brit trader. Oh. Calling me a little fucker. And the funny thing is, at the end of it all, when I got the phone back, the language of the phone had been changed from English to Danish. 
So he wasn't even actually looking through my phone. He was just randomly pressing buttons purely to wind me up. The whole incident kind of did inspire me to, to write this, this song, this, uh, the post 9-11 blues. Riz is still one of us, but if I haven't shaved, they won't sit with me on the bus. Everybody do the post 9-11 dance. Look scared, shake your ass, run the bombs, go blast. Everybody shake your post 9-11 dance. So the look scared, what's wrong? Jackson Boyle, drop a bomb. Sing a song, sing along, push and blare in a tree. Post 9-11 policy might seem harsh, but it's the terrorist fault we got. ID cards and a congestion charger, they're extending far. And electronic tags on the chav children's arms. Of course we need bell marsh for 28 days. They're all suspects, so literally be watching your back. I farted and got arrested for a chemical attack. Drops a litter on the street. You know, we're letting them win, you know, by stirring up this climate of fear. That we don't just have laws that are preventing us from doing things, but there's these kind of tacit new parameters that people feel they're having to operate with him, whether it's my family saying, well, you shouldn't speak out about being abused by Special Branch, or whether it's, you know, big radio DJ saying, I love this track, but, you know, I'd get a sack if I played it. Will it get airplane keys up? If BBC don't want it, I'll send it to Al Jazeera. Yeah. Everybody do the post 9-11 dance. Just scared, shake your ass, run the bombs, go blast. Everybody shake your post 9-11 dance. So the dust gate was wrong. Jackson Boyle, drop a bomb, sing a song, sing along. Push your hair in the tree. It takes, presumably, six months or so to choose a successor, and any six success... Months. Well, I mean, you, yeah. you, 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 you've presumably got to have some kind of um, contest inside the party and so forth. No, I, I really don't think there's any great problem with this. Look, at some point in time, there's going to be a leadership election in the Labour Party, unless I stay for eternity. Tony Blair finally stood down as British Prime Minister in the summer of 2007. In just ten years, he successfully dismantled our basic liberties. So what do you think the chances are of them now being given back? You can walk my path You can wear my shoes I believe we need to be realistic that the new terrorist threat, which is multi-continental in reach and multi-dimensional in its operation, has changed the rules of the game. But I believe that if the evidence shows it necessary to go beyond 28 days, we should indeed be prepared to do so. How we protect people's liberty has to change to meet new security needs. No one knows who's going to walk through the door of Downing Street over the next 20 years. But whoever does is going to inherit the control over us that Blair has left behind. Civil liberties are our protection against injustice from the government itself. Once the politicians have taken them away from us, it could be generations before we take them back. In the meantime, Britain could become a controlling authoritarian country where no one is safe. So who is to blame for this seemingly permanent state of fear? The government? The police? the media, or us. We are the checks and balances. We are the, the democratic process. Um, so we should start behaving like we are. That's what people should do. Unless you're a human rights nerd like me, it doesn't feel dangerous to most people until they experience injustice. Well, I think, and it's interesting because you're asking me these questions today, when there's been a very interesting judgment in the House of Lords, today. This was a case involving a coachload of women who went to Gloucestershire to protest against the war. They weren't allowed to proceed on the basis that there was some imagined breach of the peace, sealed up the bus so they couldn't get off, and sent it back to London. Most of us on the coaches were outraged at what had happened, and we knew that the police didn't have the right to do this. They didn't want any trouble to highlight what was going on at the base. The US military had said that they were prepared to fire, open fire on protesters should they breach the perimeter fence. The Furford protesters have been fighting their case for three years. The police beat them in every court, but they have just heard their judgment in the House of Lords. What did you hear? There's a natural order. Um, well, we won. The Lords ruled that we, uh, we shouldn't have been turned away from the demonstration on such flimsy pretexts as as the police have done. One of the basic liberties he was defending today 
uh, was the right to protest. If the police are allowed to behave in this way, it's the effect that that has on other people wanting to protest. People who perhaps aren't so committed or, you know, where protest isn't necessarily a way of life for them. If you hear that this is what happens during a demonstration, there were, I had a few friends with me who, for whom that was their first demonstration. And I know they've not been on a demonstration since then. So this ruling will definitely encourage people, I hope, to protest and make their voices heard. Just have a look at the wrongness of the state response to peaceful protest. Surely that's going to motivate you. Get out there, be a citizen. You've got a voice. Now the working classes are obsolete. These are the Channel 4 Political Awards 2007. I'm delighted with the person who's won this because it's Brian Hoare, the peace. Chanel, seeing as I'm in the inspiring person, be inspired. We'll feed your children and crayfish and lobster tails. Thank you very much for turning up, and we will be having another one next month. Talk to you in a bit. See you later. Why is an 077 inquiry and yeah. bin crap laws? It sucks. It's anthropologically unjust. Peace. We want more of it. Do you think that I'm some kind of dummy? It's the ideal way to order the world. Fuck the morals, this is making any money. And if you don't like it, then leave. Or use your rights. Leopards against spots, melanoma awareness. And now, your dead MP! asked me when we were told that you know the, the war was going to start what could we do she said shall we write a letter to Tony Blair and I said yes write a letter to Tony Blair wrap it round a stone and throw it through his window <laughs>